Today's episode is proudly sponsored by Aquaphoenix Scientific. Aquaphoenix, a manufacturer of test kits, reagents, and chemical feed and control equipment. Additionally, they are a distributor of thousands of products for top industry brands for the industrial water treatment market, making them the true one source for literally anything you might need. Folks, how many purchase orders do you need to write in order to get everything you need for your field test kit? Well, with Aquaphoenix, that is just one call to them, one purchase order, one shipment, and you can have everything you need from all the different manufacturers. Give the fine folks at Aquaphoenix a call today or visit them by going to scalinguph2o.com forward slash APS. Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast where we scale up on our knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm Trace Blackmore, your host for Scaling Up H2O. And folks, what a great night last night. We had a fantastic hang with some of my favorite water treatment people. You might be asking what the hang is, and I'm gonna ask you, what do you mean you don't know what the hang is? Well, it's okay if you don't know what it is, the hang is where we get together, we network with each other, we have a little bit of fun, we figure out who we don't know within the water treatment community, and then we get to know them, and then they become friends, and then they become resources and allies, and folks, it just goes on from there. So we're going to have another hang. I'm going to talk about that in the near future, but I just want to thank all the people that continue to join us on the hang and I just have a tremendous time with that. I absolutely love meeting people in our industry. You know, everybody's got a story. And if you can just take a little bit of time to listen to what that story is, I guarantee you're going to learn something. You're probably going to learn something in a very fun way because there's a story behind it. But folks, if you're not going through life trying to figure out what you don't know and what you need to learn, folks, you're missing a golden opportunity. And a great way to do that is talk to the people that are in the same industry that you are. Well, speaking of learning, here is another installment of James's Challenge. Hello, Scaling Up Nation. The next James is challenge as we grow as an industrial water treatment professional, drop by drop, is... Test-free chlorine in a cooling tower immediately and again an hour later from the same open sample. Does an open sample sitting for an extended period of time impact the free chlorine level you will test? You may be predicting yes, but how much will it impact it? Give it a try and see. If you have time, you might even try testing it again after two hours or more as well. Be sure to share your experience on LinkedIn by tagging it with hashtag JC21 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O. This is James McDonald, and I look forward to seeing what you share. You know, that's a great challenge, and it reminds me of when I was working for a customer and by the way, the customer did not have money to upgrade their equipment, but they did have money to hire a consultant to check out my work. And the consultant really had no idea what they were doing. So it, that was a lot of fun. I actually showed up to service at the same time the consultant was there and the customer said, you show them everything they need to see with the equipment. And it was very apparent they had no idea what they were looking at. Anyway, what reminded me of that from James's challenge was that they took a sample and he capped off the sample and he put it in a FedEx box and he said he was going to mail it to his lab. I'm not going to tell you which lab it was, but he said that they were going to test all these parameters on there. And one of the parameters he showed me was free chlorine. Well, folks, I got to tell you, 
when you do this James's challenge, you're going to find out how that is not going to work. And with that, on their report that they sent back to me, there was an issue with there was no free chlorine in the sample. Well, there was plenty of free chlorine in the sample. It was exactly where it was supposed to be. Just it wasn't there five days later when they shipped it cross country and it sat on their delivery dock for another couple of days. So you're going to have fun with this challenge and you're going to realize how silly that was for that consultant to ship off their chlorine sample. Nation, I am shocked. We are celebrating 200 episodes of Scaling Up H2O. I remember when I got my Bluetooth headset out four years ago and started recording my very first episode. I cannot believe that we're getting ready to celebrate number 200. And here's the thing. We could not have gotten there without you, the Scaling Up Nation. And that's why we want to celebrate the Scaling Up Nation on episode 200. So here's what I need from you. If this show has done something for you, if you have a favorite show, if there is something that has just meant something to you, one of the episodes, several of the episodes, let us know record your voice by going to scalinguph2o.com and we are going to celebrate together on episode 200. Well, Nation, three years ago, I had my returning guest for today on, Mark C. Winters, the writer of one of my favorite books, one of the books that has helped my company out more than most. It's called Rocket Fuel. He was on episode 38. So if you have not listened to episode 38, Mark goes into an introduction, who he is, what he's done, all the things about what EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System is. So if you have not listened to that episode or if you haven't listened to it in a while, you probably want to go and freshen up on episode 38 because we're gonna continue this conversation where we left off three years ago. Folks, I gotta tell you, you're gonna love this interview. And folks, I was able to take what we are getting ready to talk about and instantly apply to our company. Folks, please help me welcome Mark C. Winters. My lab partner today is returning guest and author of Rocket Fuel, Mark C. Winters. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing fantastic, Trace. How are you? I'm doing great. I had such a great time last time you came on. We were just talking. That was three years ago. Wow. Time flies. (laughs) I I, I saw you were on the schedule. Uh, I was trying to get you on the schedule for a while. I know we, we had some problems getting our schedule to meet up, but we finally did. I'm so excited for part two of this interview. Uh, You know, I looked back and episode 38 was when you were on. So we were just getting started back then. A lot has happened since then. A lot has happened. I think that's going to give us a lot of road to travel as we do this interview. If somebody just listened uh, May 11th, 2018, and they have not heard from you since then, what has Mark been up to? Well, things have been moving, uh, moving fast and furious. Obviously, it's interesting times, right? So, uh, you know, we felt really blessed as we went through the whole pandemic phase that uh, we had sort of learned a lot about working uh, virtually and, uh, you know, via Zoom and using cameras and, and things like that. So, so that side of the business really uh, didn't miss a beat and was able to continue to grow and expand. And then as far as, you know, my clients that I work with, it was really, uh, it was really interesting to see how, how creative they were in being able to really understand the situation that they were facing uh, adapt uh, in some very creative ways, either by offering new things to the marketplace or, you know, taking some kind of a pivot where they, they changed a little bit about how they did or a lot of bit about how they, they ran their business and, and to figure out a way to make it work. So, you know, very inspiring time uh, to really watch the, the entrepreneurial spirit at work and the folks that I've been, been interacting with. 
Well, Mark, last time you came on, you gave us a little introduction about EOS, but specifically the visionary and integrator. And I want to make sure that if people have not listened to that episode, to go back and listen to episode 38. I don't want to repeat what we said on 38, but just to give people a little sampling of what we're talking about today so they can all enjoy the conversation, what would you say EOS is and what is your specificity when it comes to EOS? Yeah, so in its uh, simplest form, you know, EOS is really, it's an operating system for an entrepreneurial company. So, so think about a business that has somewhere between 10 and 250 people that's kind of climbing that, that growth path, uh, you know, where maybe it's not just the entrepreneur that's trying to do everything by themselves or with a few helpers, but they're really actually starting to bring in and form a, a, a leadership team to, to help this thing grow and, and be all that they want it to become. So it's an operating system to help that team and that company get, get crystal clear on where it is they're trying to go and how they're going to get there, get everybody in the organization side to side, top to bottom, all 100% on the same page about what that looks like, help them make progress along that path. And we talk about that as traction, uh, you know, so they feel like every day when they wake up, they're getting a little bit closer to this place that they're trying to go, which gives them more confidence, which gives them the energy that they need to tackle the things along that path. And then finally, make that team healthy. So that, you know, when they're sitting there and they're looking at the other folks on their team, they feel like, you know what, we really do have the right folks here to do the stuff that we need to get done. And there's nothing we can't talk about. It's all just stuff. We're not afraid to bring it up. So we bring it up, we put it on the table, and we talk it through and figure out how to use that stuff to get us closer to this place that we're all trying to go. So it's a system. It's a set of tools and processes that collectively work together to help that, that entrepreneurial team make that happen. And we started EOS, I want to say it was six or seven years ago. And at the time, my business coach recommended the book Traction to me. I read it and I thought Gino wrote that specifically for me. It was like he was looking right into our business and saying, this is what you need. Uh, we worked with an implementer. We got EOS working here at our firm. And I just can't tell you the number of great things that have happened because we all now know how to row in the same direction. We have tools that allow us to do that. And I think the word that comes to mind is efficiency. We're all working so much more efficiently. Yeah, it's really, uh, it's about human energy, harnessing and focusing all the human energy that's in your organization. Just think of that, you know, and it's, and it's, you know, pre-state, a lot of times it's scattered and, you know, all that energy is sort of pointed all over the place. And so we're just bringing that in and get it laser focused on whatever it is that you want to point that company at. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it can be pretty powerful. And I thought Traction was one of the better books that I've ever read. And then I read this book called Rocket Fuel. And you had a little something to do with that, I think. And Rocket Fuel was, again, I mean, if you look at the visionary description, you're describing Trace Blackmore. Mm. And it. it's, uh, in fact, when my integrator read that, he wrote, Trace does this, Trace does this, Trace <laughs> does this in the margin. But it really allowed us to understand each other better. And it gave us a playbook to work with each other better. And I respect, I always respected him, but I, I'm able to appreciate how he thinks and how he works in a way that I never did before Rocket Fuel. Mm, love that. Yeah. So I, I really love the the feeling that it was written specifically for you. It was, uh, you know, we, we absolutely had the, you know, the visionary in mind. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a visionary. Gino's sort of a, a rare bird and he's a, a lot visionary, but he's also a lot integrator. Uh, but, you know, we, we realized that the visionary, because of the typical attention span that they have, you know, it, it had to connect with them really quickly. So that first chapter, it's absolutely all about you. And, uh, and then we, you know, we introduced this other character, the integrator, uh, which has some, uh, you know, a whole different makeup. You know, they're, they're just wired differently. And then, uh, you know, what the combination can do and how that all works. So I love, love hearing you say that. Well, let's start there. Somebody's tuning in right now. They just learned what EOS is. Now they hear these terms, visionary and integrator. What are they? So the visionary is sort of the classic visionary entrepreneur, typically the founder of the firm. You know, they're the one that had the, the, the crazy idea. They're the one that took the scary leap and uh, saw some opportunity out there and, and jumped out there and started the business. And, uh, you know, they're wired to really see the future and, you know, where things are headed and, and what kind of opportunities lay between here and there. Uh, you know, they're great at generating lots of new ideas for maybe different ways to approach things, how to solve big, 
interesting problems, you know, great at big relationships, usually external relationships, whether that's working with the folks in the industry or the community or, you know, whatever it might be, big strategic customers. Uh, they're great at all that stuff and they love all that stuff. And then the integrator is much more execution focused. So they're, they're really wired to pay attention to the details and follow through on things, uh, you know, to really make sure that they happen and happen in the way that they should be. And we talk about as the integrator, because they're really pulling all this stuff together. They're working, you know, harmoniously through and between all these different functions that exist in your business. Uh, and, you know, the leaders that are responsible for them to bring this all together in alignment with this vision that we've set and make it happen. So, you know, simply said, the visionary sort of makes it up, the integrator makes it happen and in a, in a healthy, healthy way. So that's how those two cats work together. And what we see is in an entrepreneurial company, you know, they don't all have this, but the companies that do have this, they are able to achieve a, a much more substantial level of success than, than those that don't. And, uh, you know, that's the name rocket fuel. It's just that combination is super powerful for propelling the, the company to, uh, you know, to a higher level. And I have to say, through personal experience, doing the things that I love to do and that I'm good at, I enjoy my job. I always always enjoyed my job, but I really love coming to work. I didn't like the details. I didn't like the day-to-day. -day. And until Traction brought that up and then you reemphasized it in Rocket Fuel, I always thought there was something wrong with me. Yeah. You know, Dan Sullivan, uh, the founder of Strategic Coach, he talks about unique ability. And, and it's, it's essentially that, but it's this area of unique giftedness that, that we all have and being able to find out and, un, you know, and understand what that is for us. And then, you know, create a world, create a structure where we can spend, either, if not all of our time, the vast majority of our time doing that stuff that we're, we're super great at and we absolutely love, love doing and then getting ourselves surrounded with people that are great at the other things, you know, and then interesting to me is, it's not obvious that this stuff that I don't like, that somebody else actually does like, but it's true. And, and so once you realize that and, and embrace it, you know, it, it opens up lots of possibilities. Well, I'm going to start off with somebody's already listened to our previous episode. So I'm going to start with the question, we're now meeting visionary and integrator. We're, we're having that same page meeting and you say we need to stick with five rules. What are those five rules? Yeah, so in the in the book we lay out a structure we call the five rules and the five tools. And so the five rules side of that, and I'll go through these kind of quickly. But you know, the first one is simply that it's to stay stay on the same page. And we'll probably talk more about that. So I'll, I'll let's come back to it. So stay on the same page is rule number one. Rule number two is no end runs. And this is a situation where the visionary is either going around the integrator or or somebody in the organization is going around the integrator, you know, to interact with the visionary in a way that sort of shortcuts the the whole structure right they're they're i call it tampering you know when the visionary is doing it they're tampering in the organization and when someone in the uh, organization is coming up they're trying to get decision or direction they're trying to just cut this integrator out of the chain and that's uh that can be very problematic uh, for a lot of reasons uh, least of which it, it causes it makes it difficult for the integrator to be effective third rule is uh that the integrator is the tiebreaker so when a decision has to be made and the, you know, the parties in the room on the leadership team, uh, you know, for whatever reason, can't reach agreement. Uh, somebody's got to be the decision maker. So let's say two of the functional leaders uh, are one saying go this way, the other one's saying go that way. They talk about it. They just can't hash it out. The integrator has the role of hearing all of this, hearing both sides, hearing, you know, all the different arguments there may be for a certain decision. And then taking that into consideration in the context of the greater good. So again, the vision and the plan that we've agreed on and, and making the call and going, all right, here's, here's what we're going to do. Because the worst thing we could do is just sit there stuck and not do anything, right? And so uh, in order for us to be decisive, make those calls and move forward, if they can't make it themselves, the integrator is the tiebreaker. And they do that with the understanding that they are on the same page with the visionary. Okay, so the visionary a lot of times has some discomfort with allowing the integrator to play that tiebreaker role. But if they've done a good job of making sure they're aligned and on the same page with the integrator, the integrator is actually in a better position because they're more in tune with the details. They're more in tune with the, uh, the, the impacts, uh, some of which may be unintentional, uh, that can happen based on this decision versus that decision. So we want to let them do that and then hold them accountable for making great decisions. 
Uh, the fourth rule is we call it the owner employee rules of the game, but it's the idea that someone who is actually an owner of the business behaves as an employee when they're working in the business. And you know, what that means is that there's no special privileges. There's no, uh, you know, pulling out the owner card and going, well, I don't have to do that because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm better than everybody else here. Right. And so, uh, conversely, what we want them to do is we want them to, to behave as the best example of any employee that we would hire off the street and bring in there. You know, we want them to set the example for this is exactly how we'd want somebody to operate in terms of, uh, you know, being held accountable and staying focused and giving great effort and all the stuff that we'd want from, from any employee on the team. And then the fifth rule is to maintain mutual respect. And this is the idea that the visionary and the integrator, it's not that one is greater than the other. We got to have them, you know, eye level with each other so that they can lean on each other and find that point of balance where they really can have, you know, they can have conflict, they can you know, hash things out, they can have differences, but ultimately they can come into alignment and, and make the best decisions and, and, and uh, move the company forward in the most effective manner. So out of those five rules in the companies that you've coached, is there one rule that's harder to get than others? Well, so it's that, it's that first one. So I'll say that in, in different companies, any company, any visionary integrator duo may have issues with any of those. But the one that tends to pop up more often than others is this, this concept of staying on the same page. And one of the reasons why is they, they sort of discount what that means. And they'll say, well, I see my counterpart every day. We office right next to each other. Our desks are right next to each other. You know, I, I, I see them all the time. And the assumption is because of that, you know, of course we're aligned. And the reality is, well, not necessarily, right? And because you're not necessarily talking about the things that you need to be talking about. And so this is where the structure, the tool that we, we call the same page meeting comes from. And so it's a discipline for those two to make certain that they are actually talking about the things that they need to talk about, spending the time on it, and ultimately, uh, you know, reaching that alignment that they need to have. Yeah, we joke that meetings don't take place through osmosis here, but we're a bunch of chemists and that's funny. And we're probably the only people that laughed at that. <laughs> so you mentioned the save page meeting. Uh, you also mentioned the five tools. What are they? Well, so let's let's dive into the same page meeting first. So. Same page meeting, again, it's a discipline where the visionary and the integrator at least once a month block time to sit down together and work through anything and everything that may cause them to be out of alignment. And so the agenda is super, super simple, and it starts with a, a form of a check-in. Uh, but I want you to think about this check-in as a little bit different than kind of the quick good news that you might have in a, in a level 10 meeting. Uh, you know, this is more of a, you know, a deep, personal relationship kind of check-in, right? So this is one of the most important relationships in your business world. So the, the corollary in your personal world is probably your spouse. So, you know, think about when you're trying to catch up on, hey, what's really going on with your spouse, how, how you might want to apply that level of depth in your relationship with your visionary or integrator counterpart. So, you know, what's going on? What's, what's, what are you spending time on? You know, what's going great? What's, what's not going great? What are you worried about? Uh, how's your health? Uh, you know, how are these other people in your family? You know, all that kind of stuff. You want to really, you know, connect on a deep human level. Okay. Second thing is the issues list. And the idea here is that both parties bring to this meeting whatever issues they've identified that they think could potentially either maybe already have us out of alignment or could very easily get us out of alignment. So if you're feeling something like we're not on the same page here, boom, you want to add that to this issues list. If there's something new coming up that you've thought about and you just want to give your, your counterpart a heads up, you want to make sure you talk it through before it kind of gets out there. So you're being proactive. Those things should go on this list too. And so you both have your lists and then that's just working through issues. And so whatever the format, you kind of want to start with the most impactful things first. But the idea is in this same page meeting, we want to get through it all. So if there's stuff here that there's a risk of us being on the same page on, we want to talk about that stuff. So sometimes, you know, you'll just take turns. So I'll do one, we'll throw it out there. We'll talk that through. Now you give me what, what the next one is on your list. And we just kind of, you know, go back and forth like that until we work it through. And again, it's it's understanding it and it's fleshing it all out so that we make sure that we are 100% on the same page. We're 100% aligned with whatever this issue is that we're talking about. And really, you know, that's it. 
So, so we, we leave that meeting with uh, an understanding that we are aligned, we're on the same page, and then we present this united front to the rest of the, of the world, you know, the organization. So we don't want to have conflict out there in the organization where, you know, they look at us and we're kind of going at each other like we're coming at it from different places. So that's what the same page meeting is all about. So I learned something with that. We, we've done same page meetings for years now, but we always vote on our issues just like a level 10. And it well, doesn't sound like we should be doing that. So the visionary and the integrator vote? Yeah, we'll say what, what's the most important things we think we should talk about. Okay, yeah. So if, if it's just you're voting to decide on what the thing is you want to talk about next, that, that's okay to have a little bit of discussion. So I don't want to get too hung up in a, a process, a specific okay, hard process enough. around that. It's just, you know, whatever is natural. So, so there should be, if there's a disagreement. So if I've got something that's really hot on my list and you've got something that's really hot on your list, we're going to get to all of it. So let's take turns, maybe doing one of mine and doing one of yours. Then sometimes you get down to the things on the list where they're all just kind of the same level of sensitivity. And, and so then it, it, it matters less, but the idea should be, we want to have the time dedicated to make sure that we get through all of it. Another thing here, Trace, is don't think that this just has to be like a meeting that we have in the conference room or in, in one of our offices. A lot of uh, visionary integrator duos will, you know, they'll do this over dinner. They'll do it on a golf course. You know, they'll go smoke cigars. They'll, you know, whatever. Right. So it's, it's just about having that time together where we, we've got the space for us to talk about the things that we need to talk about in a relational manner to achieve this level of alignment uh, that we're committed to maintaining. And Mark, I have to say, we have ours at a Mexican restaurant. Okay. And th they know when we're going to be there. They've got everything ready. And we found that we are, are so much more productive together there than we are here because there's just so many regular day-to-day -day distractions that pulls our information, even if the door is shut. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So definitely be sensitive to that, you know, if it's in the office, other things that can pull you away. And I want you to protect this time just like you would time with a client. You know, that's how important it is. You know, another thing that you just sort of reminded me of there is, uh, you know, the really great duos, you know, you own the fact that you're bringing your stuff to it that you you should be bringing to that to that meeting. But you want to understand your counterpart and and do what you can to kind of play to their how they're wired. And so I have some integrators that they they understand their visionary so well that they know, like what point in a meal is the right time to ask about a certain thing. You know, they have ways to phrase things that, uh, you know, just really help the the visionary kind of get focused in on whatever it is that they need to focus on. So, uh, you know, it's not either party's uh, responsibility to, to adapt all the way to the other person's style, but it's really both responsibility to understand the other person and, you know, do what you can to find that place in the middle where you can be most effective. We did a temperament study here, and it was specifically to learn what others' temperaments were and then what language people of, of that particular temperament seem to agree with or, or process better. That was huge. That was huge in especially our same page meetings, but everybody throughout the company. Because a word I might say might have a completely, totally different meeting for how somebody might hear it. Hundred percent, and and they'll they they may assume that your intent is one thing when that couldn't be farther from the truth, right? And so there's there's a lot of different profiling systems out there, a lot of really great ones. You know, Colby's really great, Culture Index, Strength Finders, Disc. You know, you've got all these different things, and they're all different, and and come at it from a little bit different angle. But those are all good exercises for the visionary integrator duo or for the whole leadership team to go through, like you said, and really understand. All right, you know, we're all different. And so the more I can understand that, you know, the, the more effective we can be together. My integrator asked me one time, if you were me, what do you think I would do? And I thought that was a great way of him trying to really get me inside of his head so I could understand what he was dealing with. Yeah, that is a great one. And another good one is if you were, you know, sitting in my seat right now and responding to the question you just asked me or or trying to give you some advice on the situation, how would you coach yourself, right? And, and so again, to, then that helps me kind of see in the other other party's brain a little bit. So yeah, there are lots of, lots of interesting conversational techniques to try to, again, understand each other better so we can do a better job getting to the truth and getting aligned on it. At the end of the same page meeting, 
let's say we've gone for a couple of hours. There's just no more time in the day. There's issues left. Is it okay to leave issues on that page? I'd rather you didn't, but uh, you know, sometimes you got to make that call. If it's if the things that are left are not game changing things, then that may be the right thing to do, and you, know, you just got to kind of be good judges of that. The other thing that you can do there, if you find you're having trouble getting through the list, is dial up the frequency. So monthly is the prescription, at least monthly. But a lot of times in a new relationship, a new visionary integrator duos relationship, that needs to be every week or maybe even every few days that they're they're same paging and, and working through this stuff because it's just happening so fast. But then you reach a point where the cadence of monthly is right and you should be able to get through the list. If you find that that you're not able to get through the list on a consistent basis, then maybe you want to tighten that cadence up, make it a little bit shorter uh, for a period of time until you can kind of get back to that. But at least monthly, if the ones left over are not biggies, it's probably okay. But if you're not addressing some big, important, impactful things that could show up between that one and the next one, uh, you're making a mistake by not talking it through. Whenever doors are closed or people that are in charge of the company are going out and talking, there's always the internal dialogue within the company. And in typical meetings, we cascade messages to say, this is what we talked about during this meeting. Should we be doing that with the same page? Uh, you should be asking yourself if you should be doing that. So for some things, I think the answer is probably yes. For some, probably not. But everyone should know what you're doing. So what we're committed to as a visionary integrator duo is staying on the same page. So to help us be able to do that, we have these same page meetings. So that's what's happening there. We're talking about anything and everything that we can think of, making sure that we're aligned. And you know, for the leadership team, the, the big benefit for them, and maybe you've seen the other end of this, I know I have, is in the leadership team meeting, if the visionary and the integrator aren't aligned, if they're not on the same page, that meeting will turn to them kind of hashing it out and everybody else on the leadership team is just kind of sitting there twiddling their thumbs, watching them fight over this thing, right? Which is a tremendous waste of time and energy and just really beats the rest of the leadership team down. So, so that's what you're saving them from. So if they understand, okay, this is what they're doing. This is why they're doing it. And, you know, if occasionally something gets cascaded out, whether it comes out in some sort of an announcement or uh, in the, the leadership team meeting or wherever it may show up, then I think they're going to be fine with that balance. The regular leadership meeting that you just alluded to at the end of that, and the reason we call it an L10, a level 10 meeting, because the best meeting ever, it gets a 10 rating. Should we be rating same page meetings? Uh, we don't prescribe it. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, there's just two of you. Uh, I think there's, there's certainly room and I want you to be comfortable to ask, how do we do today? Uh, you know, if you're feeling like it's not working, you know, and again, the, the level 10 rating is really about how do we do working together as a team, right? And, and there's a lot that goes into that. And one of the biggest things on the list is, is how engaged you are with each other. So if the vision and the integrator aren't engaged with each other in a, in a same page meeting, you know, there's probably something subsurface going on there that's really concerning. Uh, so yeah, I would be super comfortable asking, you know, how'd we do today? And if you want to put a number on that, fine. Uh, but I think it's more of a verbal discussion that get, should get right into, you know, here's, here's what I'm feeling. I'm seeing that you seem distracted and, and I wouldn't want to hold that until the end for a rating. I would want to bring that up in real time, whatever the issue is, whatever it is that you're sensing. And I want you to get to kind of that level in the relationship where you're, you know, you're hearing the words, you're hearing the message, but you're also reading the body language and you're really tr always trying to understand what's going on with your counterpart and seeing if there's something else there you need to talk about, something you might be able to, to help with, uh, whatever the situation might be. Is there ever a situation where we should consider bringing a third party into this meeting? Yeah. So I would say only maybe a, a point specific kind of issue where there's somebody that you need to consult. I mean, they, they need to bring you uh, some data. They need to present something. You know, so they pop in and kind of do that. But really, this is, this is about the two of you talking about whatever you need to talk about, getting aligned. And as you know, anytime somebody else is present, you know, the chemistry changes. People may be inhibited to bring up things that they would otherwise bring up if uh, the other people weren't there. So just be Super sensitive to that. Really no reason for anybody else to be there unless they're providing some additional piece of data that we need to be able to talk about what it is we really need to talk about. Mark, let's say you have an owner working in the business 
There's probably a special meeting for that. How do we handle that? Yeah. So this is a, particularly in partnership models where you've got multiple owners, a super sensitive uh, topic. And so, you know, when I was laying out the five rules, I sort of told you how important it is that the the owner behaves and plays as an employee if they're going to take a, a role uh, in the organization. And a couple of points I want to make here. So number one, one of the key tools of the, the whole process is the accountability chart. It's to, to get this structure lined out intentionally in terms of, you know, who's going to do what really first, what needs to be done, then who's going to do it, and then who are they accountable to? Okay, so think of it as different from an org chart. It's not about levels and titles. It's truly functional around what's going to happen and and who's going to do it and where the accountability is going to lie. So if if an owner is going to take a seat in that accountability chart, it must be true that they objectively are the best answer to fill that seat. And this is where people go, well, I'm an owner. I get to sit wherever I want. I, you know, because I'm an owner, I get a seat and eh, not so much. You, you have basically two rights as an owner of the business. Number one is you have your right to the share of the profits based on however profit distribution uh, happens in your structure. You have your right to get your share of, of any profits that there might be. Second right that you have is, is your voice uh, in the major decisions of the business. OK, so again, just the major decision. So it's not every little decision, but, you know, whatever uh, decisions are reserved to that owner box structure, which we'll come back to in a sec. It's your right to either vote or you know, whatever, however that mechanism works in your structure to have your say in those major decisions. But that's it. It's not a long list. It's two rights that you've got as an owner. You do not have a right to be an employee in the business. So you, you literally would have to be the best answer that we could come up with to fill that seat and, and, again, have to play by all the rules that any other employee would. So let's go back now to that owner's box. So that owner's box, think of it as a structure that sits up above the accountability chart. It's not a direct linkage. It's a rather indirect linkage. And so anybody who's an owner in the business, they sit there. If they also have a seat in the accountability chart, they sit in both places, but they, they sit there for sure if they're an owner. And that 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 owners group should have a meeting uh, monthly, an informational meeting, and then at least quarterly, it's really kind of an in-depth meeting where you really dig into the financials and, and really anything. And here's what goes on in the owner's box meeting. An owner has a right there to ask any question that they want. So, you know, while they have a right to vote maybe in the major decisions, if there's something else they want to know about, they have a right in that meeting to ask that question and then have it responded to by, you know, the other owners, or maybe we bring somebody in to visit that meeting, perhaps the integrator that has the knowledge and can give us that information and can give us that perspective. And then within the owners, they can discuss and debate and hash out and complain about stuff. I mean, whatever it might be, the owners need to air it all there in the owner's box. And then the commitment of the owners is that we'll make whatever decisions we make there. We'll have whatever discussions we want to have there. But once we walk out of this owner's box, that's it. We're, we're aligned. We're locked arm in arm. If there are disputes between owners, they cannot bring those into the organization. That's just not fair play. And so the owner's box is designed to give you the place to get whatever information you need or want as an owner air whatever perspectives you you may feel compelled to share as an owner, have your vote on big deals and get your profit distribution. And, and that's it. So that's the owner's box. What would you say the maximum amount of time you want to go between having those meetings? A month. So I'd say at least monthly. And again, uh, at least quarterly, you're diving pretty deep into the financials. Ideally, you know, every month you're seeing at least some high level financial stuff, whatever the big numbers are that you're concerned about. And again, every owner group has a little bit different uh, perspective on what it is they're trying to do. Are they trying to grow super fast? Are they trying to maximize the cash out they're pulling off this? You know, wh whatever it is. So you're probably looking at some numbers that are in alignment with whatever that high level ownership direction is. And then that leads you to talk about the things you need to talk about. In smaller companies, probably the owner is also the visionary and they're also the integrator. Is that okay? And for how long is that okay? Yeah, so there may be more than one question there, but it is often true that the visionary is an owner. It is also often true that there may be an owner sitting in one or more other seats in the accountability chart that really could be anything and everything. So maybe it's the integrator, maybe it's the head of sales, uh, maybe it's a key salesperson on the sales team, 
right? So, so they can sit anywhere and everywhere. And as long as they will commit to play as an employee in that seat, and as long as they're truly okay with that, which a lot of times, Trace, it's about ego. You know, if their ego can live with that and they can get comfortable with that because they feel like that's the place they can best contribute and they see it as, hey, the more I can contribute and this, the better this thing can work, the better we can maximize the opportunity, the more I'm going to benefit as an owner, that can go on for a long, long, long time. That can go on indefinitely. If, however, they can't get comfortable with that playing as an employee rule, then it's danger's coming, trouble's coming. And it's just a matter of, of how long it's going to take before it's going to rear its, its ugly head. I've seen lots of teams struggle with that for a long, long, long time before they finally got healthy enough to deal with it. And dealing with it sometimes means that that owner has to leave. You know, they get fired as an employee. I've actually had to do this myself. So I've had this happen in, in one of my companies years ago where there was an owner that was an employee and they did something that was just totally out of alignment with our with our core values. And, you know, I had to have that situation and fire them, you know, really hard. Right. But sometimes that's that's what you have to do to get it past it. And you know, when when I did it in that case and almost every situation I see it happen, when you do it, the whole organization breathes a sigh of relief. Because now this this source of conflict and anxiety and just pain and drama and all that stuff, it's it's gone. And everybody can get back focused on the stuff that's the main stuff. And uh, it's just better for everybody. Let's say someone is the visionary and the integrator. They're doing that well, but they're doing that because they can't afford to hire somebody else. And maybe they enjoy, because I think we all enjoy one side over the other. They identify what that side is. Do they have to hire somebody for the entire job or is there a part-time position that they could consider? Yeah, good question. So again, it's a it's a very, very, very small percentage that truly are great at both visionary and integrator and really love doing both. Uh, much more common is it's the founder who got good at integrator type stuff to survive and get the business to this point. But when you really, you really push him hard and come, come on, if you had to pick one, which one would you really love to spend most of your time on? They'll pick one. And, you know, a lot of times it's visionary, but not always. Some of them will go the integrator direction. Some of them will go a whole different direction. So it's most healthy, even if the same person is doing both, to have both of those functions, visionary function and integrator function visible. So have both seats on the accountability chart so you can really see what both are, have them clearly defined so you can really see what should be happening and have it transparent to the whole team, the whole company, so that you can kind of have that sense of, is it working well here? Is it working well there? So is this one person doing great in this seat and great in that seat? If they really are, again, and they love doing it, then that can go on forever. If they really uh, say that, you know, this visionary seat, that's the thing for me, but it's too expensive for me to hire a full-time integrator to come in and do that right now, then your options are what we call fractional integrator. And so a fractional integrator, I mean, the idea of fractional professional services has, has really exploded, you know, over the last uh, decade or so. You may have a fractional CFO, you may have a fractional marketing person, right? So, so that's, that's pretty common. And so the integrator is no different. And it can be very effective where somebody who's really good at this kind of stuff gives you a portion of their time in a week to come in and, and play the most critical roles that an integrator might play for you. Uh, that gets the high leverage stuff off of your plate as the visionary, trying to focus more there. So what are the things that you're really struggling with maybe in that integrator seat? So they can do that. A lot of times it's sort of a try before you buy scenario. So uh, you, that may work so well that that fractional relationship may actually grow into a full-time relationship. Uh, the other thing that can happen is there are a lot of folks out there that you know hang their shingle out as a fractional integrator, that part of their service offering is they will help you find the integrator. Okay. So, so they'll, they'll help get you organized, get you going, and then they'll help you find somebody to come in and, and fill that seat when you are ready. Right. And again, if you're in a healthy growing company, it's not unreasonable to expect that if you can't afford it today, you may grow, you should grow to the place where you would be able to afford it. The other the possibility there, Trace, is that you're not really looking properly at the question of whether or not you can afford it. 
And a great exercise to take a visionary through here is, uh, you know, we'll have them create a, a wish list of all the things that they would love for a visionary to be able to make true for them or make go away for them or, or whatever. Uh, also, just your issues list of the one that you have right now in your leadership level 10. Look at all the issues that are there and then go through that and go, all right, if I had a great integrator here, which of which of these issues would that solve and kind of tick tick all those issues and then go back through and go, okay, what kind of dollar impact would that have for our business? And, and kind of come up with some rough guess of what kind of dollar impact that would have for your business and add it up. And many times that dollar figure dwarfs whatever it would cost you to have an integrator there, you know, fractional or, or even, even full time. And so that all of a sudden now they're clear and, and that gets them to move forward on getting somebody more fully engaged. Did that answer the question? I think you did, but you've also sparked several more questions. Oh, good. Well, that's the idea. <laughs> so a visionary is just listen to that. And they're like, wow, Mark nailed it. That's exactly what's going on. If I were able to get somebody in here that was truly dedicated to the integrator position, either part-time or full-time, we could check those things off and I would have a happier life. Everybody in the company will have a happier life. How does somebody go about finding an integrator? Oh, well, there's the billion dollar question, right? So, <laughs> so a typical pattern I see, Trace, is the visionary picks up rocket fuel. They read the first chapter. They love it because it's all about them, exactly what you said. They read the second chapter. It's about integrators. And they go, hmm, that makes sense. I think that could help me. And then they ask that question, how do I find one? And that's where it gets kind of hard, okay? Uh, I will tell you, we're working hard on this question because we understand how important it is. In the meantime, the things that I can suggest to you is, you know, at the high level, there are recruiting firms that are sort of pivoted to really focus their practice on this. And so integrator recruiting firms are a real thing where there's people that are, you know, they do this a lot. And so they're really, really good at it. And so they can hold your hand, take you through this and basically do this all for you. Uh, short of that, you know, it's really about getting the word out there of what you're looking for. Okay. And so in the book, we've got sort of a, a, a process called the seven step VI connection process. And it, it walks you through getting clear on what it is that you're looking for uh, in, a, in a fashion that then you can put that word out there and, and begin to hire for it like you would anything else. There's a job description. So there's an integrator job description that is a great starting place uh, for what you're looking for that then you can adapt uh, to yourself. We have the assessments, the visionary integrator assessments. We call it the crystallizer assessment that gives you a both a visionary score and an integrator score. Any candidate you would want to have take that so that you can see how they score and then also to compare your answers. Right. So so the, the, the how you answered those questions compared to how they answered those questions. And we're looking for two things in terms of fit there. We're looking for a gap and a gap would be where on one of those 40 questions, you both scored low. That's a gap. Right. So neither one of us is, is particularly well wired for that. So uh, that could be an issue. And if you have one gap, probably not a big deal. If you have 10 gaps on a 40 question instrument, that's probably an issue. You're probably not a great combo. So we're looking for gas. We're also looking for overlap. So let's say you and I both score really high on this area. So instinctively, we both may want to fight for the wheel in that area. And if we haven't talked about it and cleared it up, okay, who's is that? Who's going to lead that? Who's going to hold the accountability for that? Uh, that can cause us problems. We've got to get clear on all those areas where we may have gaps or overlaps. So that's really important as you're working through uh, candidates. But you know, short of using the recruiter, the the big answer here is put the word out. And, and, you know, there's some of our communities. So in Rocket Fuel University, in the LinkedIn group, there are organic threads where people are finding each other. It'll be a post, you know, visionary seeking integrator, integrator seeking visionary. And we got lots of examples of folks that have found each other that way and, uh, and then gone on to be successful duos. You'll be surprised when, you know, people have sort of uh, started to use the integrator term and so the, the LinkedIn profile has been changed now. It doesn't say general manager anymore. It says integrator. It doesn't say president. It says integrator, right? So, so whatever traditional title they may have used in the past, they've adopted this term. And so it's out there. And so you can search for integrators uh, on, on LinkedIn. So you can find them that way. And then again, just let your circles of influence know that this is what you're looking for. And then you're going to get a lot of attention that way. Mark, my integrator went through one of the classes that you offer. Uh, several people in the Rising Tide Mastermind have gone through those classes. 
tremendous work. It's, it's amazing of the tools that Chris came away from that class. Can you tell the Scaling Up Nation a little bit about what you've put together and who's it for? Sure. Yeah. So, so it really all starts with what we call Rocket Fuel University. So Rocket Fuel University is a place for all visionaries and integrators and anybody else who, who cares about their success to come together. And it begins with a, a short video course called Rocket Fuel 101. And it's there to basically cover all these basic fundamentals of what it means to really crystallize your understanding of the relationship, talk about you know getting connected, and then really how to maximize the relationship, which dives deeper into the five rules and the five tools. And once somebody gets through that course, they they enter into a community that we call the Launchpad, and this is where we've got again all those visionaries and integrators and and others who who are interested in them gathered together to to talk to each other, meet each other. I actually host a, a monthly Q and A with that group. In fact, uh, once we get off this interview, that's my next stop is a uh, is a Q and A call with the uh, with the Launchpad community inside Rocket Fuel University, where they get to ask questions. And you know what? I answer a good chunk of those questions, but the community answers a great chunk of those questions and they get to share stories. You know, here was my experience. Here's how it worked for me. Here's what I did in that situation. So it's it's really powerful in that regard as a, as a peer group. And once somebody's in the Launchpad community and they're really clear on, okay, this is what I am, then we have a path for them. So if somebody really knows that they're an integrator and they want to commit to being the best integrator they can possibly be, then we, we guide them to what we call the Integrator Academy Masterclass, which is what your integrator and some other folks in your community have, have gone through. And that's a, a four-week intensive where there's a combination of video-based training that goes deep dive in, in all this stuff that, that we're talking about for what it looks like to be truly great as an integrator. And then I do live group coaching with those cohorts. We do that on a cohort basis, so they go through in a group. And, uh, you know, once a week I get on with them and we talk about sort of all those higher level questions. So the Launchpad community, you get some more fundamental questions. And then in the master class, obviously, uh, we get to talk about things that may be more, more complex, uh, even more fun kind of stuff to figure out. Well, I have to say the, the understanding and clarity that the people I know that have sat through the class it's just been incredible. One of my favorite tools came from somebody that attended that, and it was the issue atomizer. Oh, yeah. And it's a great visual that I never really got before you put that out there. Do you mind telling people what the atomizer is? Yeah. So the issue atomizer is just a simple uh, idea that some issues are big right? Some issues we can knock out and we can solve and take it to action and, and that's it. Uh, some issues though are a lot bigger than that. So when you get a big issue and you realize, wow, this is a really big issue, then there's there's one of two things going on. Either one, it's actually four or five smaller issues that you've just kind of glommed together. And if that's the case, identify that, break them apart and deal with the one that's the smaller one that we can deal with right now. Put the rest of those back on the issues list, okay? If, however, it really is this big gnarly issue, then that's where the issue atomizer comes into play. And the idea is your job is not to solve that big, gnarly issue completely this week. Uh, your job is to identify the one thing that if we could solve it, if we could take this action, if we could get this thing unstuck and we could get this part of it done by next week's level 10 and do that, then it's going to make that issue more clear and more refined. So we do that. We, we focus on that to do. We get it done. And then next week we come back and maybe... It's just a smaller, a bit more refined issue. And we talk about that again. And then we, what's the one thing we can do this week to get it unstuck and moving forward? We do that. Then it gets a little bit more refined. At some point, whoever owns that area on the accountability chart, they're going to have what they need. They're not going to be stuck anymore. And so we're going to have got them clear and they're going to be able to take that. Maybe even if it's not solved, it no longer needs to get solved with the leadership team. They're going to be able to solve it in their department to carry it the rest of the way to get it you know, across the finish line at the end of the track. That was huge. The visual's great. That was a true game changer in our level 10s. Awesome. Love hearing that. All right. My last question, uh, and basically it's it's just, what's the point you want to get across today? So you know, I get this question a fair amount. And really the, the, the one thing that I want everybody to take from my message is it's super important that you know yourself and, and who, who you are, what you love doing, what you're great at, and go find your compliment, right? So, so whoever that is on the other side of you that is great at and loves all that stuff that you hate and stink at, 
right? And get paired up with them. And that's going to be the key to, to making this thing go. So understand who you are and then go look for that person that'll be your complimentary ideal counterpart. Well, Mark, thank you for coming on the show. And I personally want to thank you for your help in all the work that you've done. You've come into our company through your books, through your courses, and you've made our company better. You've made our people happier. You've made me happier. Thank you. I couldn't appreciate that anymore, Trace. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for having me on. Nation, I learn so much when Mark speaks. I'm telling you, when you have the right people in the right seats, that means they're doing the right jobs and they're the jobs that they love doing, your company is ignited with Rocket Fuel. And there's no wonder why Mark named his book Rocket Fuel. We've seen it here in our firm. I've seen it in other companies that I know are running on the entrepreneur operating system, and they're making sure that they're utilizing the visionary integrator relationship properly. It is amazing how well all the teams do within the company, how happy all the people are who work in the company, and how successful the company itself actually is. Now, if you want to learn more about the programs that Mark mentioned in our interview, you can go to rocketfueluniversity.com. And I know so many of us are driving while we're listening to this podcast. So don't worry, I've got all of those items on our show notes page and they will direct you right over there. I wanted to touch on a few things that Mark and I mentioned today so you can go back and review. One of them was the temperament study. And we've had Kathleen Edelman on, our resident scaling up H2O temperament expert. And she came on on episode 117 and taught us all about temperaments. This is how do we see ourselves? How are we wired? And then how are we using particular language because of that wiring? And then the realization that even though that we say something and we know what we mean, it doesn't necessarily translate to the other person how they hear what they say. Hence her book, I Said This, You Heard That. Well, that was episode 117, and then she was kind enough to come back on episode 179, where we talked even more about the temperaments. And Nation, I've got to say, I am so impressed with all of the feedback that I've received from you, where you have done the temperament study, and you've told me it's helped with your coworkers, it's helped with your family. And the overwhelming response that I heard was it has helped with how you communicate with your spouse. I know that was the case with me because I knew exactly what was in my head, but somehow it didn't translate well when it came out of my mouth. After we started working with Kathleen, Stacy and I just communicate better. We understand what the other one is saying, but better yet, we try to communicate in a way for the other person. And I love how Kathleen says, the words we use are the gifts we choose to give the people that listen. So great mindset. If you haven't listened to episode 117 and 179, you're gonna love those. But we briefly brought that up in the interview, so I wanted to throw that out. Additionally, I wanna throw out the five tools. We talked about that in the interview, but we didn't really cover what it was. These are the main tools within EOS that allow us to do what we need to do working within the entrepreneurial operating system. The first of the five tools is called the Vision Traction Organizer. And this is the document that puts all your core values, your core focus, what your target is, what your marketing strategy is, where you're going to be in three years, what you're going to do this current year, what goals you're working on this quarter, and finally, what are the issues that are going to come up that you can see that you need to start working on. The second tool is the accountability chart. The accountability chart A lot of people have org charts where the accountability chart is different. That actually shows 
not like an org chart, who reports to who, it says who is responsible for what. And folks, I gotta tell you, that is a game changer. When people truly understand what their responsibilities are, they are able to hone in and truly own their job. So you might wanna look into that if you're still using an org chart. The next tool is rocks. Rocks are 90 day goals. What's one super important thing that if I got done, it's gonna be a game changer for my department, for my company. That is a rock. I say one thing because less is more here. I would always advise you never have more than three of these, just depending on what your load is. But don't do a mediocre job on three. Do a superb job on one. And that, I think, is a much better accomplishment. The fourth tool is the meeting pulse. And that's where we're getting together on a regular basis. We're getting together every week for a level 10 meeting. You heard Mark and I talk about that. It's also meaning every quarter that we are getting together for a quarterly meeting. And then we're getting together for a two day annual meeting. We're making sure that we've scheduled time for these meetings so we can talk about the things we need to talk about. We can observe the things that the company is showing us and we can make sure that we're making little adjustments along the way. The final tool is the scorecard. And folks, there's just so much data out there. The scorecard are the boiled down items that we can look at that are telling us what's going on in the company, what's going on in particular departments, and allow us to make decisions and see if things are working or if they are not. The last thing I want to point out that Mark mentioned, I think was huge. He mentioned when I asked him, is it okay for somebody to hold several positions? And I was specifically talking about the visionary and the integrator. He said, eventually you have to realize that it's not about, I have to spend the money to hire somebody else. You have to change your mindset that it is costing me money because I'm not doing what I am best and highest at, and that is costing me money. That is costing the company money. And if I can get somebody that comes in and now their best and highest are those tasks, imagine how much better they're going to get done. Imagine how much better the company is going to do. And I had to think of the story when I was working with my coach, Tim Fulton, and Tim asked me after one of our meetings, and by the way, during that meeting, he was telling me that I was way too busy, I had too much on my plate, and I needed to figure out how to get rid of some of the items because I was just running out of bandwidth. He asked me what I was doing when I got home later that Friday, and I told him I was cutting the grass. And I think he threw out there, well, you're not taking your wife out to dinner. You're not doing, you know, probably a number of five things that he had mentioned. And I said, no, I'm going to cut my grass. And he said, well, how much do you think it would cost to get somebody to cut your grass? And it was $50. And I was not going to pay somebody $50 to do something that I was perfectly capable of doing. And he asked me, what was the cost of not spending that $50? Now, think about the time that I could have spent with my wife. Of course, that is priceless. You can't put a price on that. But look at all the other things that I wasn't doing for my company. I wasn't doing for the people within my company that I could have committed those two to three hours with that I was not spending $50 on. So to date, I have a company come and do my lawn. My lawn has never looked better. They have a crew that gets out of a truck. They have equipment that I will never acquire in my lifetime. And it looks like I'm living on a golf course. My lawn looks great and I don't have to worry about it. It just gets done. So my challenge for you is, what are you good at? What do you love doing? And why aren't you doing those things? What is causing you not to be able to do them and shift to realize that you shouldn't be doing those things to begin with? Do the things that you're good at, that you love doing, and I promise that will unlock the potential that you have. It will make life more fun. It will make you more happy. And I promise it will give you the bandwidth 
that you need to spend time with the people that matter most. And folks, I hope that helps. I know it helped me. And I really appreciate you listening to my favorite podcast, Scaling Up H2O. And I will have another brand new episode for you next Friday. Have a great week, folks. So many people ask me what a mastermind is. Does that mean in six weeks, I am going to be the best water treater that I can be through a training class? Folks, that's not a mastermind, that is a master class. What a mastermind is, is when like-minded people get together, we process issues, we form common bonds of friendship around each other, and we celebrate and push each other towards success. It is the key to so many people unlocking their potential. To find out more, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind.